Hey guys, Mr. Jansen here, here to take you through the 100 illustrated ways to pass your science regents. Uh, here we are going through 91 through 100. So let's get started. 91, plate tectonics states that Earth's crust is broken into plates which can move. So once again, the crust of the Earth is fractured, okay? And all these fractured gigantic pieces, they shift, then they move. They converge, they diverge, they slide by one another. Um, and they're moving at the rate at which your fingernails grow, okay? And this is all caused by convection. And the driving force behind that is basically the internal engine inside the Earth, the core. Okay, so if this was going to appear as a region's question, um, it may appear something like this. According to the Earth Science Reference Tables, for the last 200 million years, continents on opposite sides of the Atlantic Ocean have generally been doing what? Okay, so once again, it's saying to the reference tables, so you better go to your reference tables. And we're going to, you know, once again, your chart, um, your, your geohistory chart, okay? And that geohistory chart, okay, listed right here, okay, um, and we're trying to show you right here on this right-hand side what's been happening to the continents. Well, they started out a little further south, they all kind of came together, and now they're spreading further and further apart, okay? So we're trying to see that the continents are shifting further apart, okay, or choice two. Great. Okay, number 92, the three main types of plate boundaries are convergent, divergent, and transform. Once again, reference tables, okay? So that's all in the reference tables right there. Um, kind of straightforward with regards to the different types of plate boundaries. Um, and they're all listed right at the bottom here. Transform, divergent, convergent, and all your other, you know, um, motions that, that are occurring here on this page, okay? So make sure you're aware of that. Um, you know, it's... It's pretty straightforward, you know, all your different movements. Um, the fact that they're either coming and going apart, coming together, or sliding by one another. As the question on the regions, it says the diagram below shows four major types of fault motion occurring in the Earth's crust. Which type of fault motion best matches the general pattern um, in California San Andreas Fault? Okay, so reference table San Andreas Fault. Um, this is North America here. Here's San Andreas right over here. So they're sliding by one another, okay? If they're sliding by one another, okay, that's going to be which one? Right here, this lateral fault, the shearing going on, okay? Great. Moving on to number 93. Mountains formed by uplift. So once again, um, at maybe a convergent boundary of two plates coming together, and you're going to ha have the cross get forced upwards, okay? Classic example of this, okay, um, is India slamming into Asia forming the Himalayan mountains and, you know, basically pushing the land up, okay? Um, and that's going to be opposed by the amount of erosion going on trying to bring the land back down, okay? But right now, the, the land is still moving up. Um, diagram below represents the Acadian orogeny, okay, that resulted from the collision between North America and the European plate. Which geologic process most likely called the uplift of the Acadian mountain? So something going up, okay? So once again, we're... we're talking about this coming from the left, the North American plate, and the European plate coming from the right, okay? And that's going to result in all these types of faulting and folding, okay? So all this stuff is getting folded. Everything's getting folded right here, so that's why it's choice D, okay? Number 94, the half-life of radioactive element can't be changed, okay? So half-life is steady, all right? Uh, regardless of whether you heat it up, you know, w or whatever you do to it, it's going to stay constant, okay? So this number right here is not going to change, okay? It will always be 5,700, okay? So once again, students have a problem with this because once you go through one half-life, then you have half the original remaining substance left, and students are like, well, wouldn't it take less time? No, it's always going to take the same amount of time. It's a random decay. It's a random breakdown. That's why it's always a steady decay rate, okay? Um, great. So uh, as a region's question, it may appear something like this. If the radioactive material were cut into pieces, the half-life of each piece would what? Stay the same. Nothing's going to change. Choice C. Okay. Number 95. Index fossils are good time markers. Once again, they're widespread. They live for a short amount of time. Okay. So you want something that is spread all over the place, but only listed for a short amount of time. Okay. You have a whole mess of these in your reference tables. All right. So in your reference tables, all those fossils along the bottom of this chart here, we're going to call these index fossils because they were widespread all over the world, but they lived for a short amount of time. Okay. So... Um, when geologists find these in rock, they know exactly how old the rock is, which is very useful, all right? Okay, as a region's question, it may appear something like this. Okay, the diagram below represents three bedrock outcrops. The layers have not been overturned. Letters A through E identify different rock layers. Fossils found uh, in the rock layers are shown. So which fossil is an index fossil? Okay, so of all the pictures here, you want one that's widespread, meaning found in all three, you know, rock layers, and is basically short-lived. So it's only going to be in one of the horizontal layers or just one of them.
Okay, so you're looking for a picture that's all in all three outcrops, but is only in one thin layer. And that looks like it's going to be choice number three here because it's found here, here, and here, but it's only found in this letter C layer. Okay, very good. Um, going on, number 96, undisturbed strata, the bottom layer is the oldest. Okay, so if there's no overturning, the bottom layer is the oldest. Okay, so once again, you know, as sediments, you know, kind of fall down underneath the water, they're going to build up, build up, build up, build up, build up. Okay, and the the newest is on the top and the oldest is on the bottom. Okay, just like a masonry putting down bricks. They got to put the ones on the bottom down first before they put the ones on the top. Okay, so they're all going to form different layers. As Regent's question, it may appear something like this. Okay, unless a series of sedimentary rock has been overturned, the bottom rock layer is usually, that's pretty straightforward, the oldest. Okay, the bottom is the oldest. Number 97, intrusion and faults are younger than the rock they are in. Okay, so we call this the principle of cross-cutting relationships. In other words, um, if you're going to crack a rock, you need the rock there first. If magma is going to intrude upon a rock, the rock needs to be there first. Okay, so the rock, all right, is older than any kind of intrusion or fault, or another way of saying that, that the intrusion and fault are younger than the rock. Okay, you could say it both ways, all right? As a region's question, it may appear something like this, okay? Uh, the photograph below shows an escarpment located in the western United States. The directions for north and south are indicated by the arrows. A fault in the sedimentary rocks is shown on the front of the escarpment. Photograph shows that the fault was most likely formed well. We know the fault came after the rocks were put down, but what side shifted up, what side shifted down? Well, looking at it, it kind of looks like the north side, the left side shifted down, and the south side kind of shifted up, okay, or choice one right there, okay? Great, cool. Number 98, uranium-238 dates old rocks, okay? The half-life for uranium-298 right here is four and a half billion years. So once again, to go through one half-life, okay, for 50% of uranium to be remaining and 50% of lead-206 to be remaining, um, it would take four and a half billion years, okay? And that's what we use to date our oldest rocks found here on Earth, all right? Um, as a reason's question, it says the characteristics of radioactive... The characteristic of the radioactive isotope uranium-238 that makes the isotope useful for accurately dating the age of rock is that its half-life doesn't change, okay, or number two. So, number 99, uh, carbon-14 dates recent living objects, okay? So the half-life of carbon-14 is approximately 5,700 years, okay? So that means after 5,700 years, it'll be half carbon and half nitrogen. Then after another 5,700 years, it'll be a quarter carbon and, you know, 75% nitrogen. But once again, it's a shorter half-life, okay? So it's going to date stuff up to like about 80,000 years old. Anything beyond 80,000 years, then there's not enough carbon left in it, okay? And you won't be able to detect it, all right? Um, as a region's question, it may appear something like this. Which radioactive isotope, which radioactive substance would most probably be used in dating the recent remains of a plant found in sedimentary deposits? Recent carbon-14A, okay? And 100, use your reference tables. This is one of the most important tools in your test-taking arsenal. Oh, man. You know, it, more than half of the test is coming right from your reference tables. I think, um, you know, the 2014 was about 68% of it was straight from the reference tables, okay? So once again, make sure, you know, just about every question, you're flipping through this, making sure that, you know, this can or, or, or cannot help you. Um, most of the time it will help you so make sure you're always flipping through this okay guys that concludes um our final video here uh stay tuned for more videos and good luck on the regents